Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Ines Begaran and I'm a PhD student here at the University of Melbourne. And today I'll be discussing single scalar lambda quark solutions to the G-2 problem in the electron and muon, um, which we've titled Getting Chirality Right. This work is based on work I've done with Raymond Volpus, which was published in PRD in 2020. So just to give you an idea of how this talk will go, I'll begin by outlining what the G-2 puzzle is, describe then what scalar electric quark solutions to this puzzle look like, describe some hurdles that these models need to overcome and how we do so using a coupling ANSATS. Then of course, finish with some results. So let's start with the puzzle. The standard model shows two distinct fermionic sectors, the leptons and the quarks. Then there are of course the gauge bosons and the Higgs. And these blue lines here represent the allowed interactions within the standard model framework. And of particular interest for this talk will be the lepton photon interaction that can be represented by this effective vertex here. So imagine that these fermion lines here are a particular lepton and this line here represents the photon. So within this blob here could be either standard model or beyond the standard model particles. The effective interaction can be parameterized by the Lagrangian shown here, where the first term here that could be represented by this vertex is the magnetic dipole moment, and the second is the electric dipole moment. Here, F mu nu is a standard electromagnetic field tensor. Now, what is the magnetic dipole moment? One can think of it as the way that a spin, a half particle, interacts with the magnetic field. So how does the spin couple to the field? So one would think about this in terms of the mu vector here, where E is the electric charge, M is the particle's mass, and G is some dimensionless quantity that specifies a strength. In the Pauli non-relativistic theory, the intrinsic magnetic moment of any particle G could be any value. Then when Dirac built on this and added relativity, it was predicted that G was equal to two for elementary spinner half particles. Nowadays, in full quantum field theory, we can actually calculate corrections to the g equals 2 result. And this is what we parameterize by the value of AL. So here on in, whenever I see AL, I'm going to refer to it as g minus 2. So I'll start by outlining for you probably the more famous of the two anomalies we're going to try and conquer. So here is the mu on g minus 2. So this is a more long-standing anomaly. However, it was recently updated by the Fermilab G-2 collaboration. So there are a lot of papers, especially a lot in the more recent weeks, that have investigated possible new physical explanations for the G-2 anomaly. The more recent announcement actually updated that anomaly to a 4.2 sigma significance. And this potentially could be increased further as the Fermilab results reports on new data. So we have the standard model prediction here for the G minus two given in green. And we have the experimental average of the Brookhaven and Fermilab results to date given in the purple band here. So other muonic anomalies exist both in flavor and precision physics. And these corroborate the idea of perhaps there being new physics that preferentially couples to the muons. And these include some particular famous anomalies called RK and RK star. However, for here, for brevity, I'm not going to go into details on that. The electron G minus two problem is a little bit more subtle and perhaps a little bit more messy at the moment. The electron G minus two was established as a precision test of QED and for the standard model. And measuring the fine structure constant alpha would be done by assuming that the standard model prediction for the G minus two of the electron was equal to the experimental value. And then from that, deriving a value for alpha. However, this process assumed that there was no BSM physics there. So in order to parameterize potential BSM contributions to the G minus two, we would require a determination of alpha that's independent of A. So at the moment, there are two conflicting experimental results for alpha, which are achieved using different interferometry experiments. And unfortunately, these two results actually disagree by more than five sigma. The first is using cesium and the second using rubidium. So you see here that the cesium measurement um, leads to a 2.5 sigma anomaly in the G minus two of the electron. 
and that the direction of this deviation is actually in the opposite sign to that of the muon. If instead we look at the rubidium result, you see that this corresponds to a deviation of 1.6, which many may argue is not exactly an anomaly. However, so far, there's no resolution to the disagreement between these two experiments. So for now, what we're going to do is we'll assume that while the electron G minus two is still unresolved, we'll focus on the more significant anomaly, also because it's more interesting problem to try and tackle. The reason, well, the G minus two of the muon, the G minus two of the electron, being in opposite signs, but comparable magnitude, perhaps this indicates a common origin via flavor violet and couplings to an exotic field. So let's now talk about scalar electric quarks. So earlier when I outlined the standard model, um, if we were to introduce scalar electric quarks into the standard model, they would appear right about here as permitting a direct interaction between the standard model leptons and quarks. So they're hypothetical particles and they directly couple, couple the lepton and quark sectors. There are, there are actually a finite set of scalar leptic quarks and they're discussed in detail in this review. However, here I've shown in a table the transformation properties of these leptic quarks. The masses and Yukawa couplings between standard model and BSM fields are generally free parameters in these type of models. To explain to you the chirality of the couplings and the language that I'm going to use to refer to them, See here that the right-handed coupling refers to the right-handed quark in the interaction. And the left-handed coupling refers to the chirality of the quark being left-handed. Phi here represents the particular leptic quark that we choose. Now, mixed chiral scalar leptic quarks have both the left and right-handed couplings. So there are actually only two of these scalar leptic quarks that are mixed chiral. And these are S1 and R2. And both of them have actually garnered quite a lot of interest in the literature for different flavor physics anomaly models as well. And what's important about these two is that they could generate sizable corrections to G minus two at the one loop level. For mixed scalar, scalar leptic quarks, the contribution to G minus two is actually calculated here, where these are as earlier defined as the right and left-handed couplings to the different standard model leptons. Now, the sign definite component looks a little bit like this, and this variable sign component contains an additional part, which is this mass of the quark insertion here. So this quark mass insertion means that if, for example, the top is running in the loop, then this particular variable sign term way dominates the sign definite term here, which could be potentially suppressed by the mass of the muon or the mass of the electron. So for these two leptic quarks, we can exploit the variable sign term to give flavor dependent opposite sign corrections to the G minus two. And as I said earlier, this is only true for S1 and R2 terms the mixed chiral scalar leptic quarks. So because the Yukawa couplings with standard model fields were generically free parameters, we have some choices to make. And I'll preface the next discussion by saying that, of course, what I'm about to discuss isn't showing that there's a basis dependence of a physical result. The argument that I'm trying to make is that the choice of basis can affect how clear it is to make a definitive claim about the viability of a model. And you'll see what I mean very soon. So one may ask, how easy is it to turn on or off couplings between particular flavors? So if we want to generate the contribution to the G minus two from a top containing loop, how easy is it for us to just switch the other couplings off or switch these ones on and specify the values to allow it to generate the correct magnitude of correction? So the answer actually lies in the choice of where I put the CKM matrix. So let's use, for example, the S1 leptic quark. So for the S1 lepto quark, the interaction Lagrangian before electroweight symmetry breaking looks a little bit like this. So we see here the interaction between the lepton and quark left-handed doublets and the right-handed uh, charge lepton and standard model uptight quark. After electroweight symmetry breaking, we rotate the fields into the mass eigenstates. 
and they're rotated using these non-physical MathFrac R and MathFrac L rotation matrices. And we recall from our earlier studies of particle physics that the only physical combination of these particular matrices is the CKM matrix. Now, because of that, we have a little bit of freedom when we talk about what we're rotating and how we're rotating it. So one can think of the uptype basis as the basis that refers to us specifying a particular value of the coupling matrix that refers to the coupling between the charged lepton and the standard model uptype quark. And then we allow the neutrino and downtype quark interaction that is related because of that SUV, SU2 structure to be generated by the CKM. In the downtype quark basis, we specify a value for the downtype quark neutrino coupling, and we allow the other coupling to be generated again by the CKM. So these are what we term the uptype or the downtype bases. So now I want to motivate why we would choose one over the other. So imagine we want to switch off a particular coupling. For example, maybe we want to switch off the coupling between the lepton, the first generation lepton, the electron, and the third generation quark, which is the top. So in the uptype basis, this is very simple. We just set that particular coupling to zero. But in the downtype quark basis, this becomes an expression that we have to set to zero. So it's a little bit more messy. It's not as simple as varying one particular number. It's setting a particular relationship between different values in the matrix. So we should guide our basis choice by looking at what couplings we want to control the most and motivate this with observables and constraints. So in this case, if we look at the downtype quark basis and imagine that we were working in the downtype quark basis, and we were trying to do a calculation of the contribution to G minus two. If we did work in this basis, it makes it very hard for us to determine viable textures for the Yukawas. And the reason is because of this constraint mu to E gamma. Because the top quark in the loop and the strength of mu to E gamma constraints means that if we were to generate any sort of coupling to the top quark for both the muon and the electron, then the coupling with the top quark would immediately generate a contribution to mu to a gamma, which again would be chirally enhanced. So you can think about this as cutting off the side of the muon um, interaction, cutting off the other side of the electron interaction and sticking them together to form mu to a gamma. Now, of course, even if the coupling is very small, that enhancement from the mass of the top is significant enough that we almost always invalidate the model. So you can see how one may be tempted to rule out all scalar electric quark models if you only look in the downtype quark basis. However, if we adopt the uptype quark basis, set the G minus two of the electron as being generated by a charm containing loop and the G minus two of the muon be generated by a top containing loop. Switching off all couplings except for the charm electron and top muon couplings in both the right and left-handed coupling matrices. This constraint from mu to e gamma is then entirely avoided by having this different intermediate standard model quark flavor. And we see that the leading order contribution to the G minus two in S1 and R2 have very similar structures. The difference in the intermediate terms here, so the seven on four and the one on four has to do with the different charges of these leptoquark fields, as does the sign. However, this product of left and right-handed couplings here means that we have the power to adapt the sign of the contribution between the muon and the electron. So let me outline for you now a couple of key results. So now that we have two possible viable models, we have the S1 and the R2 model, we now assess constraints using two different scan methods. So the first is to always generate contributions that fit within, say, one sigma, of the allowed G minus two of the electron and the muon. And the way we do this is we logarithmically sample over left-handed couplings and we calculate the right-handed couplings according to the G minus two expressions that were shown on the previous page. We then output real valued points and we generate the one that's closest to giving the central value of the G minus two. We then check the generated coupling against a perturbativity constraint and then we proceed to check other constraints. The second method is to completely decouple the electron and muon sectors, which is what we've done by allowing the charm containing loops versus the top containing loops as generating the different G minus twos. So we sample over the left and right handed couplings logarithmically for both of the separate muon and electron sectors. 
So for the S1 leptic walk, you see that the allowed region is within here. And the important constraints are shown here as different colored dashed lines. So the allowed region is just inside here. And this here is shown for a benchmark mass of 2 TeV. In method two here, you see that these this is both the left and right-handed coupling shown on these axes. And these bands here um, refer to the one sigma and two sigma allowed regions for the G minus two of the electron here and for the muon here for the muon related couplings. So this shows which constraints are more important for which sector. Um, and it also shows that without artificially enforcing the G minus two there, we're starting to see that there is viable parameter space so long as we are choosing this uptight quark basis. So it becomes more clear to us where this is allowed, where this is not allowed. For the R2 lepto quark, it's very similar. There are just slightly different constraints. And this has to do with the underlying SU2 structure in particular of the um, lepto quark uh, Lagrangian. So here we see, again, there's an allowed region in the center. And again, there's significant non-zero regions that are permitted in both the electron and the muon sector. So here we've argued the viability of the single leptoquark solution for simultaneously solving the anomalies in the G minus two of the electron and muon. We've identified the two mixed chiral leptoquarks capable of generating sign dependent contributions to these G minus twos. And we've shown that the lepton flavor violating constraints such as mu to e gamma can be avoided by looking at an uptype quark basis and decoupling the electron and muon sectors by coupling electrons to charms to generate the G minus two of the electron and muons to tops for contributing the G minus two of the muon. We could extend this work to complex couplings to motivate consideration of EDMs as well as the G minus twos. And this is work that I am currently undertaking. I'll draw your attention again to the e-print mentioned here, which was published in PRD in 2020. And thank you for coming to my talk and I hope I'll see you at the panel session.